what's called the Song of Moses is really the praise of God. But the very last words of the song is this, the Lord will reign forever and ever. And as we have brothers coming back from London, as we have brothers coming back from Hong Kong and Bombay and all around the world, all that I can think of is that God is moving in the same powerful way today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Truly, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Let's repeat that together. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Again, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Again, the Lord will reign forever and ever. And the congregation said, Amen. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer at this time. Father in heaven, it is so awesome to be here with the saints to worship you. To be with brothers and sisters that have come on back to encourage us. To hear good news from a distant land, Heavenly Father. To know the powerful impact of the brothers in the Heatway group. Father, we are so excited to be alive at this generation. Truly, it is by grace that we are here. Father, today we really want you to come into our hearts, to convict our hearts of sin and righteousness and judgment to come through your Holy Spirit. That when we walk out of here today, Father, we will be filled with convictions that we did not have when we walked in and that we will live a changed life because we have communed with you. We've been with our brothers and sisters. We've heard the word of God. And we've been filled with the spirit of God to go out and live a changed life. Father, we love you so much. Please use this lesson to change our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Turn to John chapter 2. The title of the lesson this morning is Clearing the Temple. Clearing the Temple. In John 2, in verse 13, we find the record of the Holy Spirit. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're gonna raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. I'm afraid this passage does not fit too well into modern Christianity's view of Jesus. And I believe the challenge for every generation, though, is to get back into the Word of God. To see Jesus as He is, because that is how God is. But we need to see Jesus how He is, because that's what we need to be. Amen? We've got to understand that God is love. Jesus is God in the flesh. John 1, 14. And so, we can be confident then that every action that Jesus did was an action of love. It may not have been the mushy, ooey-gooey kind of love. It may not have been sentimental type of love, but it was God's kind of love. And we see love personified. We see love incarnate here in this passage. We realize from the scripture it was time for the Passover feast and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and as he entered the temple courts and his way into the temple to worship the Bible says that he saw men there selling cattle and sheep and, and doves and 
Others sitting at the tables exchanging money. This, this was not the place for these things to be done. Now, of course, these guys found that out a few minutes later. But if you will, picture with me what happens. As he enters the temple courts, he cannot walk by the situation. He steps to the side, and in my mind, very silently, while the disciples and the others that are with him are gazing in perhaps amazement at just entering the temple at Jerusalem. It was, it was an incredible structure. And they're looking at all the activity that's going on. And yet Jesus slowly is pulling separate cords, separate strands, and binding them together in his hands, looking at the situation. With the mind of God, he's looking at the hideous condition of his father's house. And as he binds those cords together, there is filled within him a holy and a righteous anger, not a fit of rage but a holy and a righteous anger as he ties these cords together and then all of a sudden yells and starts driving out the sheep and the cattle and with the ones that were selling down, he says, get these out of here. He goes over to the money changer tables. He doesn't say, guys, can you get, get the money collected and move on out, please? He grabs the table and just overturns them. The disciples, they're standing on the sidelines, totally blown away. Now, it is interesting, they all think of one scripture. You know, there are a lot of scriptures in the Bible. Do you know that? It is interesting, though, that they all came together and they thought of one scripture at this point from the book of Psalms. Zeal for your father's house will consume me. They said, this is God. He is totally consumed with zeal. Without question, we look at Jesus and we see God incarnate. We look at Jesus, we see what we need to be. We see a man who wanted to please God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength and was willing to act alone no matter what his closest people did. That is our Jesus. And he didn't do this just to be upset and be mad. He did this out of love for God, and yes, out of love for those people. They need to know they were doing wrong. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks to the church. In verse 16, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? See, he's comparing the whole church of Christ to God's temple. And that God's spirit lives in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. See, one of the analogies that the scripture uses to describe the church of a living God in the first century is that of being the temple of God. And right here, I think that we have got to grapple with our first question of the day. Are we going to allow tradition or truth to be in the temple of God, the church of Jesus Christ today? That's the first question that we've got to grapple with. For Jesus, he refused to let tradition, those things that have been going on for years there in temple courts, continue to go on the same. He couldn't walk by it. He had to say something. He had to do something, even if it meant acting alone. I really believe that one of the greatest and most misleading elements that is in Christianity today are the traditions that surround salvation. You know, if you ask six people on the street how to be saved, you'll come up with probably seven different answers. You know, there are a lot of different opinions out there, isn't there? And sometimes we even value the religious leader's opinion. But bottom line, there's only one 
person's opinion that's going to count come the judgment day, and that is God's. Amen? Amen. And the way that you find out what God's truth is, is by looking in the Word of God. You know, tradition is such a dangerous and insidious thing. The Bible says that if we hold to traditions, we actually nullify the Word of God and our worship becomes in vain. Matthew 15, verses 6 through 9. I want us to look at what Jesus taught about the truth of salvation. And then it's time to clear the temple. Amen? Turn to John, chapter 3. Nicodemus comes to him at night, and he's very complimentary of the ministry of Jesus. And then Jesus says in verse 3, chapter 3 of the book of John, In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Right here, the Bible is abundantly clear about what it takes to enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Amen? You know, Nicodemus, he's, he's, he's not dumb. He's not stupid. He says, what do you mean? You mean you have to be born a second time in your mother's womb? And he was just being sarcastic right here. He says, what do you mean? She says, come on, Nicodemus. Don't you understand that you've got to be born of the water and the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God? Don't be surprised that I say to you, you must be born again. See, I think the problem is, is that this phrase, born again, in our society today has a lot of negative connotations to it. And there are a lot of Bible words that have some negative connotations to it. That's Satan's way of turning us off to God's way. And if it's in the book, let's embrace those phrases. Amen? And so if the book says, be born again, let's us say, you got to be born again. Amen? And let's not be afraid of the world's opinion. Well, the question might come, what does it mean to be born again? Well, later on in the chapter, in verse 22, we read this. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out in the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. That sort of answers it, doesn't it? You know, when Jesus was with his disciples, what do you think they went out to do? They baptized. Now look what happens. Now John also was baptized in Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water. Do you like that phrase there? There was plenty of water and the people were constantly coming to be baptized. John had a powerful, powerful, powerful ministry. Amen? I mean, people were just coming to be baptized by John. Chapter 4, verse 1. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it wasn't Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. You know, this is very interesting right here. In a very succinct way, the Apostle John sums up for us by an interactive conversation with Nicodemus what it takes to be in the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, listen, you've got to be born again of the water and the Spirit. Then he goes into a discourse about what Jesus does in doing that. He goes out with his disciples, they go out in the countryside, and they baptize. That sounds like a lot of fun, amen? And, you know, I know like during the, the campaign that we had, wasn't it so exciting just to get off of our couches in our living rooms and go out with our discipleship partner and baptize together, just to go out and share our faith, amen? You know, I'm convinced that when we're out there together sharing our faith, that's what's really going to bond us together. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. But the thing is this. John the Baptist had a great ministry, but it's great to know that the Messiah had an even greater ministry. Amen? Amen? And we find that even more people were being baptized by Jesus. But look at the phrasing in chapter 4, verse 1. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Who were the individuals that Jesus baptized? Jesus baptized the people that made the decision to be disciples. See, this was the whole ministry of Jesus, is to be out there making disciples. You know, I think a lot of people wonder, well, what happened on the very last 
time that Jesus saw the disciples there on the mountain after his resurrection, Jesus says, listen, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Listen, if Jesus gave them that charge as the very last thing to do, don't think that this passage right here in chapters 3 and 4 was something that just took place in a two-week period. Whenever Jesus was with his disciples, this was his plan, to make disciples and to baptize them, to gain and baptize disciples. That is the plan of Jesus. Amen? I think that we can look around the religious world today and we find so many cheap grace theologies. I mean, one cheap grace theology is, well, all you need to do is, as a baby is just be sprinkled. And I don't mean to be facetious at this point, but I mean, there are groups that practice that. And they hold to that. And yet there's not one account of a baby being baptized in Scripture. And beyond that, how can a baby have faith? How can they respond to the cross of Jesus Christ? Secondly, another chief grace response to salvation is simply saying a prayer. They pray Jesus in your heart. That's what I did between 10th and 11th grade. I very sincerely, I was very sincere. Between 10th and 11th grade that summer, a group of college students came to church I was going to at that point, and I just said a prayer and quote-unquote asked Jesus to come into my heart. I really, I really felt saved afterwards. But, you know, feeling saved and being saved are quite something different. Don't you agree? I mean, you know, here it is. It's football season now. It's no longer baseball season, right? Amen? Baseball seasons. We're waiting for next year. Amen? It's football season now. And they're going to run the instant replays. You know how it is when you're rooting for the Patriots. And you're sitting at a certain point or you're watching TV. And if you're really a Patriot fan and you see one of the guys go up the middle and he's right there down by the goal line, you always think he scored a touchdown. And when he's right there, you go up, you're standing in the living room shouting, you just know he scored a touchdown. I mean, you feel it in your gut. It's time to go ahead. Only a few more seconds left the game. Surely he scored a touchdown. You feel it. Then they run the instant replay. And the official was right. He didn't score a touchdown. See, feelings can be deceptive. Amen? Amen. And so even though you're, you may have been baptized as a baby and you feel saved, that's not what the truth is. Even though you may have sincerely prayed Jesus in your heart and have felt saved, that's not what the truth is. I think even within churches of Christ, there's been an effort to say, turn over to Acts chapter 2 and convert people to the doctrine of baptism. Now, I think baptism is very important. If Jesus thought it was important, we need things important. Amen? Amen? But look at what it says in Acts 2. Peter's preaching... He's preaching about Jesus, and then in verse 37, this is the response of the people. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, Those who accept this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. When Jesus was preached in the book of Acts, when the cross of Christ was preached, and that is the message, amen? When the people understood they were sinners, they were cut to the heart. It wasn't a matter of just understanding they had done wrong. They knew that they were sinners. They knew that they were lost. They were cut to the heart. And they said, what shall we do? And Peter says, you got to repent. You got to change your life, not just feel sorry for what you've done. You got to repent. You got to change your life. You got to turn away from the old life and turn to the new life. That's the decision you make when you make the decision to be a disciple. Amen? That's the terminology of Scripture. You make Jesus Lord at that point. Then and only then are you ready to be baptized for two purposes one, to receive the forgiveness of sins, and secondly, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when the people heard this message, verse 41, 3,000 people were baptized that day. Isn't that exciting? Amen? I mean, we got about 3,000 people a day. Just look around at what 3,000 is like. Just turn around. Wouldn't that, that have been awesome? Everybody gets baptized the same day. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Amen? And all of these now, what happened after verse 42? They devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking bread, and prayer. You know, some people want to say, well, this was taught after baptism. I think not. I think they knew what they were doing when they were getting baptized. It would be inconsistent with the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus was to gain and baptize disciples. If these guys didn't baptize disciples, if they didn't teach them the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then they would have disobeyed Jesus just a few days after his ascension. See, I really believe that so much of the religious world is in error. And we've got to make a decision. Are we going to just sort of walk into the temple and worship God as, as we always have? Or are we going to say, hold it, stop! i got to say something right here. There's some things that are not right that are being taught. We cannot have a cheap grace theology in Christianity. We cannot embrace traditions. We have got to hold to the truth, no matter how many or how few people hold to it. Truth is truth. Amen? And so we may have people in the crowd today that have never done this, that have never made the decision to be a disciple of Jesus and be baptized. If you've never done that, you need to make your decision today. Just don't walk in the temple and then walk out as if you've seen no, nothing wrong. Let's change it like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Secondly, not only do we need to make the decision between tradition and truth, we have to make the decision between being religious or righteous. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul uses the temple of God in a second analogy in verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All of the sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are brought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You know, right here we have a very strong teaching. The context is that Paul is challenging the Christians to stay pure. That's always a challenge, isn't it? Even for us Christians, it is a challenge. I think we've got to learn to be open when we're struggling with sins, particularly sexual sins, because those wreak a special havoc on our very being. That's what the verse says right here. Because the other sins you commit are outside the body. These are against your own body. Do you see that? I think it's, it's so powerful here at the church when we have couples like Mo and Terry, who are baptized in the Christ right here, and then find each other in the Lord, and then make the decision to be married. Isn't that fantastic? And the great thing about the church is that you're able to date different people. Of course, that's not why we're here is to date, but it is the place to find dates. Amen? I mean, you start dating non-Christians, then you're going to get in some real major problems, aren't you? But something that's so beautiful is that we've got such great teachers in the church that teach us from the Word that you need to learn how to be faithful to that guy you're going out with or that girl you're going out with by not putting your hands on the temple of God. That's their bodies, right? To not get into petting, to not put your hands where you're not supposed to, to not to get into sexual intercourse, that is something that is reserved for marriage. See, I think a lot of people feel like, well, you're denying us fun, you're denying... No, 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 no. God teaches us faithfulness. God teaches us to honor purity. Now, he's not saying that sex is, is, is bad. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that it is sin when you commit sexual acts outside of marriage. And I appreciate the elders of this church and the other teachers in this church when they lay down the kind of guidelines for datings that we have in this church so our young people can be pure. Amen? And so the beautiful thing is that Mo and Terry having been here, having been baptized in Christ, they kept their relationship pure all the days of their dating. And then now, as a married couple, they can physically come together and enjoy the closeness that we should have in marriage. Amen? You know, a lot of people have weird sexual hang-ups in marriage because they messed around before they were married. Of course, the great thing is we can be forgiven of even sexual sins when we get baptized. Isn't that great? But then the challenge is, is to remain pure after that time. 
And you should have seen the wedding yesterday. I mean, it was an incredible extravaganza of praise to God. It's because the people that were there loved Mo and Terry. They knew the kind of lives that they had lived. And I mean, God had been honored and glorified. And we need to honor God with our bodies. Amen? Now, what we have the teaching right here is this. Is that just as the Church of Christ, the Church of the Bible, is made analogous to the Old Testament temple, the Bible also makes an analogy to our own physical bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you know, I think that some of us need to clear out the temple a bit. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We have to make the decision between being religious and being righteous, and there's a difference. In Ephesians 4, and verse 29, the Bible says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, God, forgave you. Verse 3 of chapter 5. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Aren't you glad that the Bible makes it so clear what we need to be? Amen? See, I really believe that we need some challenges from time to time in the church to clear out our temple so we do not grieve God's Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is not an it, it is a he. It is the Spirit of God that comes to reside in your body, in your temple. Isn't that fantastic? And he gives you the power, the Bible says, to overcome any sin. We'll look at that in a second. But what are the challenges that we have that we need to clear out of the temple. Well, let's look at the passage. Number one, any unwholesome talk. Unwholesome talk. Well, what kind of unwholesome talk might we have? Well, later on he talks about obscenities, swear words, foolish talk, coarse joking, flippancy. These are not right for the Christian. Jesus says, out of the heart the mouth speaks. You know, I used to excuse people having fits of rage and saying bad words or bad things when they were angry. No longer do I do that. I used to sort of rationalize, well, they were just angry. Listen, Jesus, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. If someone says something in anger, that's what they feel in their heart. That has to be dealt with. It's time to clear out the temple. He goes on, he says, listen, verse 31, chapter 4, get rid of all bitterness. You talk about an interesting sin, it's bitterness. Bitterness is resentment. And a funny thing, you can be religious, you can go to church, go to Bible talk, even share your faith, and yet if you are bitter on the inside, you are dying spiritually. And the dangerous part that Hebrews 12 talks about is that bitter root can not only cause you to lose the grace of God, but you can spread it through unwholesome talk to other people, through qualms and quiet reservations, and bad attitudes. And the way that things start is usually through sort of language like this. Well, I think that Al Baird's a great elder. I mean, really a super elder, but... Da -da 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 -da. See, that sounds so positive, doesn't it? But when anyone sticks in, but, you know, there's a problem with that person's attitude, amen? And very often, the people that we're bitter against are either authority figures because we've had a fear put into us by authority figures being mean to us in the past, whether they be parents or teachers or coaches or whatever the situation is, or it's those people who are really trying to interact with us one-on-one -on -one and help us with our lives. We get bitter towards them, and you know what the issue is? We don't want to change what they're challenging us with. Anger is a sin if it's not dealt with. You can be angry like Jesus, but if it's a fit of rage, it's sin. Brawling, slander, 
along with every form of malice. Then he goes on down. Verse 3 says, There can't even be a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a hint. Even if something looks immoral, it's got to go. That's why we tell the brothers, Hey, you shouldn't go into an apartment and be alone with a sister. I mean, there's just too many temptations. And besides that, what do your non-Christian neighbors always think? I mean, you know how they think, right? I mean, we all used to be there, right? We can't have any impurity or greed. You know, I think so often we do not want to have these kind of sins challenge us because you can't see impurity or greed. Now, you can see evidences of them. But I think a challenge for all of us as Christians is to make a decision. Are we going to be simply religious or are we going to be righteous? You can be religious and come to all the services, do everything. But you still won't be righteous until you get these things out of your heart. And the only way to be righteous is that you are open. James 5, 16 says, you must confess your sins to one another. When is the last time you sat down with your discipleship partner and said, brother, I need to talk to you about my sins today, yesterday, this week? You know, I think it's been too long. One of the brothers this week came to me and he says, brother, I just need to get with you. I've got so much sin in my heart I've got to talk about. I said, okay, let's get together today. We got together and he just, it was, I mean, it was convicting. He just shared these sins that have been going on for weeks and weeks and weeks. But you know something? I challenged them on the issues and then there were tears and then we prayed. There was forgiveness and he's doing awesome spiritually right now. Isn't that great? I want to challenge you, before the World Mission Seminar comes, that's going to be fantastic, amen? Before the World Mission Seminar, let's get all the sins out of our hearts so God can move powerfully in this assembly, amen? amen? Secondly, we have got to deal with the issue of greed. We've got this special missions contribution coming on up. We can't just sort of make the goal of two million. We can't do that. That's, that's not Christian, is it? I mean, God does immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So what do those people need to do? immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Amen? We can't just go over it. We need to annihilate that. Amen? We need to blow it away. Let's not be religious. Let us be righteous. Thirdly, we've got to make the decision whether we're going to be a spectator or a servant of God. Look at verse 8 of chapter 5 of Ephesians. For you were once in darkness, but now you're in the light of the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know, remember back in John 2? Remember how Jesus was walking into the temple to worship at the Passover feast, and he's with the disciples and some of his family even. And the rest of them just sort of walk on, want to walk on in, but Jesus looks around and he gets upset about what's in the temple. They had desecrated his father's house. And he knew something had to be done. Jesus was a servant of God. The disciples were simply spectators. I put before you that the church is going to be what it needs to be. We need to be like Jesus. Amen? And what's the Bible say right here? We need to have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. But in verse 11 it says, but rather expose them. It doesn't say just for God to expose sin, though he will expose sin. I mean, it's uncanny, isn't it? He will expose sin. It doesn't just say for the elders and the evangelists to expose sin. It doesn't just say for the house church leaders and the Bible talk leaders to expose sin. He says each one of us needs to expose sin. That's what it means to be like Jesus, amen? But see, the reason that we're not like Jesus is we're basically conflict avoiders. I mean, we look at what happened in John 2 and we go, wow, that was bold on Jesus' part. Doesn't that blow you away? Come on, admit it. Doesn't that blow you away? See, you're a conflict avoider. I just had to get you to admit it right there. 
I mean, Jesus did what was right. And we've got to make a basic decision. With the people that we're trying to bring to Christ, do we love their soul more or do we love the relationship that we have with them more? If you love their soul more, then you're going to be willing to expose the deeds of darkness in their life. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's a scripture we all learn as young Christians. Verse 8. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you become so dear to us. See, I think that a lot of times, young Christians really want to bear fruit. I mean, that is our purpose, to bear fruit for the glory of God. Amen? But they're so anxious to bear fruit that they fail to love the people that they're sharing with in the way the Scripture talks about. Paul says, listen, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, that's the good news, that's what it's all about to be a Christian, but we are also delighted to share with you our lives as well. You see, discipling begins the very first day you meet somebody. And then you spend time with them. You become involved in their life and they in your life. And a very beautiful thing happens even during this period, even though they haven't made the decision totally to be a disciple, because that comes at baptism, amen? But a very beautiful thing happens to them is that their heart becomes like your heart because, you see, you're spending time with them. It's not that simply time has changed them, but your walk with them has changed them. You see how powerful that is? And so right here, Paul says, listen, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our very lives as well. You know, it's an amazing thing when you really fall in love with the people you're studying with. I put before you, ultimately, you will never be abundantly fruitful for Jesus Christ unless you love the people that you're studying with. Unless you love the people you're studying with. You cannot be a spectator. You've got to be a servant of God. You know, a while back, I remember studying with a person, young man, and uh, I'd really put a lot of time into him. We'd spend a lot of good time together, a lot of fun time together, and it is fun to be with people. Amen? We can have a great time with people, right? And we put a lot of good time, but then he missed the Bible talk, and I was a little bit concerned. You know, when someone misses Bible talk, when someone misses church, you know, something's going on. Satan's at work. Amen? So I went down to where he was working, and I said, hey, so-and-so, I... I really missed you last night at the Bible talk. See, I loved him more than the relationship with him. Because, you know, when you say that to someone, you know, sometimes they can draw back. And he says, well, listen, I just had a lot to do. My work was coming on in. I hadn't eaten. Uh, I had a lot to do that night. I said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Are you telling me that your work and eating was more important than the Bible talk? He says, yes. Well, no, not exactly. I said, so-and-so, I said, listen, you need to understand, I missed you last night. You need to be a Bible talk. That's how you're going to learn to be a Christian. And he bristled for a few seconds and says, uh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. And we kept on studying. Well, then we came down, you know how it is when you get the light and darkness study, you talk about sin. You lay it out. You go through each one, one by one. It's not the most exciting study, is it? And the way that I teach the brothers and sisters here how to do the sin study is you study through Galatians 5 and then the Christian goes first and confesses his sins. Have you been doing that with your non-Christian friends? You know, it's a lot, it's very powerful when you're open with your life first instead of saying, okay, Non-Christian, you're first. You know, if you are open with your life first, I mean, they, they're willing to be open. And you know something? It really reminds us where we came from. Amen? But you know, we got into the sin study with the same person. And we got on in there, and I shared my life, and then I said, okay, how about this sin? No, how about this sin? How about this sin? How about this sin? And I had known from some other situations that he had been involved in immorality. And I said, so-and-so, I said, listen, are you sure you haven't done this? He says, I am absolutely sure. I said, well, 
then how come did this happen at this time? And I just laid it on out. Eee, doggie. He goes, yeah, I sinned. And you know, it was a really uncomfortable moment. You ever been at one of those uncomfortable moments? And you're hoping it moves by really quick? But you know something? If we're not willing to endure uncomfortableness, we'll never win people to Christ. It was an uncomfortable thing for Jesus to go in that temple, to look around, survey the situation, say, this needs to change. You know, another situation that came on up came a little bit later with this individual. We studied through everything. And his words were simply, I can't keep the commitment. And I said, it's not can't, it's won't. He said, no, I can't. I said, it's won't. It's no, I can't. I said, no, it's won't. This went on for a few minutes. <laughs> Finally, I said, yeah, you're right. I guess I can, but I don't want to right now. I said, that's terrible. He says, yeah, I know it is, you know. And, but see, the thing about it, we had spent enough time that our relationship carried us through these points. Amen? Amen. And today, that young man is your brother in Christ. Amen? Amen? Now, there's the same principle is true with Christians. You've got to expose the deeds of darkness. You've got to love them more than a relationship. Don't be a conflict avoider. Are you going to be a spectator or a servant of God? That's the challenge that we've got. As a matter of fact, back in Ephesians, there's a song that was written that's quoted by Paul. And he says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He says, wake up the sleeping Christians. Get them going. That's what he's talking about right here. You know, we have got to be servants of God who overturn the table of priority. Amen? We've got to be servants of God and overturn the tables of sin. And we've got to be servants of God, even with our fellow Christians, and overturn the tables of fear. One of the biggest sins Christians struggle with is timidity. Fear of sharing their faith and fear of failure. When we love people more than a relationship, then discipling is going to take place in a great, great way, and we will change their temple of God, their lives, and the whole church will be changed, and there will be a glorious church to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Finally, we got to make a decision whether we're going to be empty or filled as Christians. Look at verse 15 of chapter 5 of Ephesians. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul's having a little bit of fun with words right here, actually. He's saying, listen, don't get drunk on wine. Don't be filled with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. Be drunk on the Spirit. Amen? I mean, I thought Keith Wilder was pretty close last night. Amen? I mean, it's great to be in the Lord. Amen? See, I really believe that even as Christians, we can be empty. You know, I was reading this article in USA Today a few days ago about Carrie Fisher, who was the uh, young woman that starred in the Star Wars trilogy. And uh, she was just talking about her life, he says, and it's simply a little quote in there, it simply said, my life is so empty. My life is so, she's done so much, so much glamour, so much stardom. And she simply says, my life is so empty. You know, we need to get the message out to everybody because everybody outside of Jesus Christ is empty, amen? Because only the Spirit fills the void of the Spirit. Now you can put short-term substitutes in there, but short-term Substitutes are not going to get the job done. Only the Spirit fills the God vacuum within each one of us. But you know something? Emptiness can even come on a Christian. You go, oh no, that can't be. We know from Acts chapter 9 and verse 17 that when Ananias came to Paul, he said, I want you to receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit when you're baptized. 
You see, we're filled with the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. You remember when you were baptized? You remember, you were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a great moment, amen? But it's amazing. Christians can become empty. Well, what do you mean? Well, it's the old parable of Jesus. He talked about it in Matthew 12, I believe, verse 43, in which he said, there was this house, and in this house there was this demon. And the house was swept clean of the demon, and it was gotten out of there. But because nothing else was put in the house, the demon came back with seven more demons, and the condition of the house was worse at the end than in its former state. You know, I believe there are a lot of Christians that sweep clean the temple at baptism and are really excited about it, and it is a great feeling dealing with all your sins. But they remain empty because they don't put anything good in its place. Turn to Galatians 5. In verse 19, he tells us what we've got to get out of there. The acts of the simple nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, that's what's available to you through the Spirit of God. That's what's available to you. But if your life is not being filled up with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and so on, then what's going to happen is that you're going to become empty and then you'll become sad and then you'll become directionless and some of the old demons will start to come back in. And that's when you think about maybe returning to the world maybe even quitting your Christianity. It's because you didn't fill your house, the temple of the Holy Spirit, with God's Spirit. Well, how ultimately can we fill our temples, our bodies with the Holy Spirit? Turn to Acts chapter 4. We find there's a great persecution in Jerusalem, and the church gathers together to pray and in verse 29, is at the end of their prayer in chapter 4, and it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I believe that when we humble ourselves before the Lord, we get out of our heart all the fears, all the timidity, all the sin, God's Spirit will come back into us and fill us up. And then we will be able to go on out and speak the Word of God boldly. Amen? I mean, look what happened right after this. In Acts chapter 5, things were going so awesome that the charge against the Christians in verse 29 was, was simply this. In verse 28, he says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. You see, when Christians are filled with the Spirit, then they can fill the city that they're living in with the Word of God. Amen? I'm convinced of this. Empty Christians produce empty churches because they have nothing that draws the world to them. And secondly, they themselves have nothing to ask the world to share. You can be an empty Christian if you are not putting the good things in your lives, if you're not doing the things that Christ has commanded you to do, if you're not out there sharing your faith, you will never have the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, all the fruit of the Spirit. But today, even if you've been an empty Christian, if you simply pray to God, you confess your sin to a brother or a sister, you let the Spirit fill you on up, then you can go out today, fill with the Spirit, and speak the Word of God boldly. Isn't that exciting? Amen? And I really believe that the seminar that we're coming upon this week is going to be not just church-changing for this congregation. 
It's not just going to have an impact in the United States. This is going to be earth shaking. We are going to turn the world upside down. Amen? Amen. I really believe with all of my heart that before us stands a task that can be done. We can fill not just Jerusalem, not just Boston with the Word of God, but we can fill the United States with the Word of God if all Christians are Spirit-filled. We can fill not only the United States, but we can fill all the nations with the Word of God if simply all Christians were remain righteous before God. Amen? Amen? And so the challenge this morning is really quite clear. Number one, are you holding on to traditions or truth? Number two, are you religious or righteous? Number three, are you a spectator or a servant of God? Number four, are you empty or filled? Here's the challenge. Be like Jesus. Let's clear the temple out. Let's simply be the church of Christ that goes by the word of God. But not just the church. Let's clear the temple out. Let's clear our own lives out. And let's be the people of God that God can use. Amen? If you need to respond in any way today, if you want to be baptized today, if you want to rededicate your life today, if you want to confess sin today, come forward to the men that are standing in the aisles as we sing as our invitation song, I've decided to follow Jesus. Let's stand.